at age 23, I took eight months and I had this journey that I thought would be my last big journey before I became a proper American workaholic. What I learned is that it was it was cheaper and easier and safer than I thought it would be. And in a certain way, I'm still on that trip. I just sort of let those lessons and that inspiration flow into the rest of my life. And I've been alternating travel with sort of sharpening a sense for home ever since. Hello. Howdy. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's a nice sunny day in uh, the central of the United States. Which part of the United States are you in? Uh, Kansas. Have you spent much time there? Kansas. I've been to Kansas. Yeah. Isn't that where Dorothy's from? That's what they all say. Yeah. (laughs) So um, what's your name? I'm Rolf Potts. Uh, I'm a travel writer and author. Uh, Rolf Potts. I know you, Rolf Potts. You do. I I, I interviewed you years ago from my website. uh, Oh, yes, indeed you did. Yeah. How are you? We never actually communicated except via email. That's true. That's sort of an old, like in the Zoom era, it's much more intimate. There's a sort of a more of a facial recognition aspect to it. That was completely email. I've been interviewing travel writers by email in a series for more than 20 years. And I think, I don't know, three or four years ago, you were one of them. Uh, Indeed, I was. Rolf Potts. Amazing. A, so you're, you're, you're a bit of a travel legend yourself. Travel's my thing. Yeah, it's uh, I've written now my fifth book about it. The Vagabond's Way came out uh, this month. But uh, yeah, that's what people like to talk to with me about travel. And I suspect people like to talk with you about travel. So um, they, we're in good company. Indeed. They yeah. do indeed. So what inspired your, your, your wanderlust? Oh, man, I think it was just being young and seeing the world as this gigantic, exciting place that I wanted to go out and explore. Um, and so much of my first book, Vagabonding, is sort of about permission. I think sometimes it's easy to put off dream travels and not realize that you have permission, too, that you don't need to throw a lot of money at a dream trip. You can just create some time and throw your time at that dream trip. And so, um, yeah, ever since I was young and I sort of thought I couldn't, and then I came into a point in my life where I started trying to travel and I realized that it was just a lot easier and cheaper and safer than everybody let on. And so travel has been a real central part of my life ever since. And I I always say that uh, travel is the school of life Hmm. um, in that I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about the world. What would you say are some of the things that you learned from your travels? Well, I I think I learned that culture is an intuitive thing, um, that you can go to another culture, you can read about it. But then when you're living in another culture, the instincts are a little bit different. You know, I lived in Korea for a couple of years. I was working as an English as a foreign language teacher there for a while. And I'm American. So individualism is seen as this positive uh, word. Um, Whereas when I tried to translate it for my Korean students, they were a little... um, Uh, I don't know if they're upset about it, but they were confused because individualism in Korea is not an individualistic country. It's more of a collectivist country. And individualism can be seen as a betrayal of your community and your family, putting your own interests above the interests of your community. I had no idea. In fact, I could have read about that before I went to Korea, but it was until I was in Korea and realizing that they're not the rugged individualists that Americans think they are, that that, that this can actually be a good thing, that putting your own interests a little bit behind your families or your neighbor's can be a good thing sometimes. And so that was one of the very first lessons I learned from cross-cultural travel that just the starting people are great everywhere in the world, but they sort of have a different, uh, a different uh, flow chart, a different system, uh, a culturally driven idea of how they see the world. Um, and it can be really interesting and exciting and rewarding to experience that, that cultural difference. I'm always asked that question. That's why I like like to ask it, like, what did you learn? And and the answer I always give is that ultimately we're all the same. Hmm. Um, Irrespective of color, religion, we're at base humans. We're at base connected to that humanity that flows through us. Um, And that to me was a life-changing revelation because I'd always been told that we were different. I would turn on the news and we're different. I would, you know, maybe uh, read a newspaper and it was always us against them. Mm. But I realized that in so many ways, 
we're just the same. And that just changed everything for me. Yeah, me too. I, I think that oftentimes, well, we see news headlines through, it used to be called the man bites dog. You know, the idea that uh, nothing would make the, a, a dog biting a man wouldn't uh, make the news because that's pretty normal, but a man biting a dog would. So it's headlines for hundred years or more have been about the bad news, right? Well, now we're sort of in the clickbait era, which is the same, the same sort of system that it's sort of trying to get that lizard part of our brain worried about things. When in fact, um, travel really does reveal our shared humanity. And I think sometimes even the travel industry sort of presents travel as this menu of things you can buy, these experiences that you can seek out, when in fact, the most rewarding parts of travel are about those very basic things about love and family and recreation and food. I mean, there's so many things that we share as, as humans that are even hard to market as a travel thing. But, but I think just like playing volleyball in the village square or sharing a meal or just, I've learned so much about family. I live, I live near my family in Kansas. It's why I moved back here. That's a lesson I learned from travel that people around the world, they really pool their resources and their love as families and they center it in their lives. And that's a lesson I try to take back home. I, Kansas isn't the sexiest part of America to live in, but it's close to my family. And it's, it's a place where in the same way I saw people in Namibia and Thailand uh, and Korea centering the importance of family. I've tried to do the same thing here in Kansas. And I think another word for family on some level is community. Hmm. And my travels have shown me how important community is and how in the West it's somewhat, how do I say this? It just doesn't seem to be as strong as it is in other parts of the world. And that's a really you know, I don't want to say horrific. Horrific is a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a really bad thing to like not have that sense of community. And when you don't have that sense of community, it causes so many issues, you know, issues that we're seeing happening in front of our screens every day. Um, I remember I've shared this story before, but I remember I was in, um, in Bali and I was driving down some road in Bali with someone on the back of the bike. And uh, I, I saw this, these people sitting around in a circle talking to each other. And I said to my friend, I said, what, what on earth are they doing? And she says to me, they're just talking to each other. I was like, oh, all right. Because we don't do that, right? I mean, generally, we don't sit in a circle and talk to each other. There's always something happening, whether it's TV, whether it's food, whatever it is. We're not just connecting with each other. And here I was in Bali and it was such an obvious thing. And I couldn't, it just like hit me, hit me a little bit. Are they talking to each other? Oh, all right. Then. I think in the, in the West, we're in too much of a hurry. We, we live mm. in this idea that life is full of options and we need to rush through them so that we can tick all the options off our list. And oftentimes it's not until we go to, to Bali or Morocco or to Paraguay or someplace where people just let the day breathe a little bit. And it's like, oh, you can do that. You can just talk to somebody and not really have a goal. You know, you're not trying to optimize this conversation. You're just enjoying the conversation. And so I think that really, that really ties into the way that we've chopped our time in these little tiny bits in the West. And we have to, we sort of have to collect them and rush through them. And sometimes we superimpose that that mindset to travel. And it's not until we slow down and have a conversation for the sake of having a conversation and, and sort of pay attention because I think so much of modern life consists of distractions, you know, in, including, I mean, there's, there's a, there's actually a, like a smartphone is a great travel tool, but there's also a hundred inbuilt distractions that are algorithmically smarter than we are. Right. And so I, I think it's not until we stop trying to see the world through our phone and all the options it's giving us and realizing that the present moment, the people who are around has tons of options. And I think in a way, uh, tr travel makes us better community members back home because it allows us to see the best of what other communities are doing with their time, with their resources, with their values, and bringing them back into the conversation back home. And so in, in, in The Vagabond's Way, in my new book, I really tie that connection between travel and being at home. And in a way, coming home can be seen as the next destination on the journey. It doesn't have to be where you turn off the travel spigot. It's where you can take all those great experiences and flavors and lessons you learned and integrate them into your home life. So what was the inspiration? You said you've written five books. 
what was the inspiration to write the, the last one you wrote? Um, well, I my first book is the book people like. It's called Vagabonding, an Uncommon Guide to the Art of Long-Term World Travel. It's about taking a year off instead of a week or however long to travel in earnest instead of just as a slight escape from your life, but in an embrace of your life. And I've written some other books. They, they all touch on travel in one way or another. But during the pandemic, uh, I actually, two great things happened. Well, one great thing happened. I met my wife just through uh, against all odds here in Kansas. I met a, a Kansas girl who was supposed to be in Europe at a time that I was supposed to be in Europe. And we wouldn't have met each other there, but we were both home for the pandemic. We met on a dating app and we went from hello to let's get married in no time flat. And one of our morning rituals was going out and reading to each other, just sort of a way to connect to each other at the beginning of the day and to connect to that day at the beginning of the day. So we would read things like uh, Mary Oliver poems or Thich Nhat Hanh meditations or Ross Gay's miniature essays. And one thing we read was Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic, uh, which for each day of the year, it gives you a quote by a Stoic philosopher and then a reflection or a meditation on that quote. And I thought the travel world needs this in part because, you know, like, the joy of travel starts in its anticipation before we even leave the door that having a travel plans makes our daily life happier. And then when, when we're on the road, we're engaging in life in a new way. And then when we get back home, then we're using those lessons. So I thought, why not have a daily reading book about travel where there's a quote about travel and a reflection on different phases of the journey. And so in, in my newly married, newly excited state, when I couldn't travel, I, uh, in retrospect, very quickly, I've been keeping quotes from a quarter a century of travels. I wrote this book and it, it just made a lot of sense that I was, I was able to sort of replicate a mental, a spiritual journey through a daily reading book that people can come back to. Do you have that book handy? I do. It's, it's uh, The Vagabond's Way. Uh, and the subtitle is uh, 366 Meditations on Wanderlust, Discovery, and the Art of Travel. And so there actually are only 365 days. So it's, it, it, it works for a leap year too. Uh, <laughs> can, can you read uh, from today's, uh, no, no, yeah, from today's uh, date? I absolutely will. It's, I had to ch check the date, October 25th. So let's go. So the October, um, it, it, the year long arc of the journey, it replicates um, the course of a journey. So by October, we're, we're very far, like January is about, Inspiration, February is about planning, March is about getting started. But so by October, you're pretty far into the journey. And it says the title is Wilderness Imbues a Journey with Perspective. And the epigraph is Paul Shepard's Man in the Landscape. It's a book that was written in 1967. He says, To the desert go prophets and hermits, through the deserts go pilgrims and exiles. Here the leaders of the great religions have sought the therapeutic and spiritual values of retreat, not to escape, but to find reality. So that's the epigraph, and then the um, and the the body goes like this. There's some foreign words that I'm going to mispronounce, but here goes. Some words that don't have a ready English equivalent were born out of the very geographies that gave rise to their uniqueness. Waldenskemkite, for example, refers to the sublime feeling one gets while alone in the woods, and it's connected to Germany's forested landscape. Dadiri, the Ngagi indigenous term for quiet awareness and deep listening, emerged from the tropical savannas of northern Australia. Kachu Fugitsu, which refers to the personal discovery one feels while attuned to nature, is tied to the subtle changes of the four seasons in Japan. To truly experience the awareness evoked by these words is inseparable from immersing oneself in the wildernesses that inspired them. In this sense, encountering almost any wilderness, a Bolivian salt flat, an Uzbek desert, a Gabonese jungle, can make us feel sensations and consider perspectives that we can't quite describe. The nature we behold in our travels can be gorgeous, but truly appreciating its grandeur goes beyond scenic viewpoints. Immersing ourselves for a time in a wilderness is something we feel in temperature shifts and insect bites, something we smell in the trees or swamp or ocean, something we hear in the wind and birdsong. Wilderness is, in short, something that makes us feel insignificant, even as it inspires us. It is a setting that allows us to leave the narcissisms of human-made environments and celebrate our own smallness in the context of a complex and humbling and intoxicatingly beautiful world. Um, yeah, so that's about each day is a different aspect of travel, and that's about throw yourself into an environment that you're not familiar with at all. Um, 
And it's, it's a gift that keeps on paying. I was in Norway for the first time with my wife who has Norwegian cousins. I'd never been to Norway in 25 years of traveling. I never went there because I thought it was too expensive, right? For the price of a beer in Norway, I could, I could spend a week in Thailand. Well, I met my wife's cousins and suddenly just the landscape, that forested lake rich landscape where so many Norwegians live in, in, in cabins during the weekend. And just the idea that you could bend down and pick up, pick up a raspberry or a cloudberry off the earth really allowed me to experience Norway in a way that went beyond my guidebook. So um, it's funny that that's the date uh, that, that we randomly picked because that's today's date. But I just recently experienced being in nature and just sort of being quiet and alone allowed me to experience Norway quite recently in a way that, um, that an app on my phone would not have. I love that you read that specific day and that it was expressing what it was expressing because I just came back from Namibia. You mentioned how you'd been to Namibia. I love so, Namibia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure you've you've been to the Skeleton Coast, mm, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I drove around Namibia by myself, and I uh, was in the car in the Skeleton Coast. And as you know, there's pretty much no one there. Yeah. So you're basically driving in the middle of nowhere, and I was I was I was driving, and I had this like realization that I was basically it was as if I was driving on Mars. It felt mm. like I was mm. driving on Mars. And I, I, I was listening to this really beautiful song and I had this moment of wonder where I, I burst into tears, good mm. tears, joy, that I was experiencing this moment that was so profoundly beautiful, right, that I could never have experienced had I watched it on a TV show or had I read about it in a, in a book, I had to actually be there to be in this experience. This like, I don't want to call it a miraculous moment, but it was like a, um, it was a moment of just pure wonder that transcended my mind that just went straight into my, my, the essence of my being. Um, and, and, you know, I can sense that you understand that a, because you just wrote that book and you just basically expressed that in that book, but B because you've seen the world. Right. And I guess what I'm getting at is how can we inspire people to travel when they are fearful of getting on a plane or when they are fearful of going to the travel advisories and they see do not travel or whatever it is. Right. Um, how does one inspire them to bypass that so they can have moments of wonder that you had in Norway, that I had in Namibia, and we both had all over the world? That's a good question. And it's an important question because I think wonder is a gift of being alive. You know, we experience it more, I, I, I think, when we're children. We get really excited about little things. We see a bug and suddenly we're super excited. Well, um, and travel sort of recreates that childlike state of wonder. And it's, it's a great thing. Yeah, and unfortunately, again, in the man bites dog clip, clickbait world of media, we sometimes we we take at face value that the world is a, val a violent place without really digging beneath the surface of that. And I think these days enough people are traveling that you can just go online, go to Google or social media, and just sort of Google your own demographic. You know, I'm I'm a, <clears throat> a 22 year old from Florida. You know, I'm a, I'm a 76 year old from Uzbekistan or wherever. And odds are you'll find somebody who's out there having a good time. That there's a lot of witnesses. Un unlike when I was young, when I was coming of age in the 80s and 90s, I didn't have the internet to go on and see that there might be other people like me in the world. People from this very provincial part of the United States, Kansas. I didn't have that. Now, if people go online, they might find me. You know, I'm a Kansas, Kansas guy who went out and traveled the world. And so I think sometimes there's a baby steps aspect to it that travel close by. You might not have enough money to fly halfway around the world. We'll take a road trip or take a hike or ride your bicycle for a while. I think so many things can count as travel. And one thing, it's so funny, one that um, today's, the October 25th entry was about being in the wilderness and two that you brought up the Skeleton Coast because it actually appears twice in the book and they're both lessons that I think that would interest you. Um, one, well, actually, what's the most common tourist attraction on the Skeleton Coast? The shipwrecks? The shipwrecks, yeah. So yeah. I was, um, actually, the shipwrecks figure in both of these. One, I went to this, I, some shipwrecks are in better shape than others. Some have crashed, run aground fairly recently, and they still look like ships. Some just look like piles of twisted garbage. 
And so I went to this place. It was, it was a ship called the Winston. And, I, and it just didn't look like anything. I was disappointed. But then I found out that this, the Winston had crashed in October of 1970. And I was born in October of 1970. And it sort of made me feel my own insignificance, like this shipwreck that crashed the, the month I was born. You now it doesn't even look like a ship, you know, just this someday I will be gone from the earth too. And I should really embrace the wonderfulness that is today because eventually like the Winston, I'll just, I will be um, detritus on, on earth, right? The other, the other thing I found on the Skeleton Coast is I ran into souvenir vendors. I'm not sure if you ran into souvenir vendors. They come to the shipwrecks because that's where tourists go. And they, they're Damara uh, tribes people. They come down from the mountains and they, they dig up these semi-precious stones. So I was talking to a souvenir vendor, nice guy. And I was, I was sort of trying to ask him that, that hard question of like, what's it like? To, isn't it depressing to just sell rocks on a beach, you know? And, I'm, and so I, I try not to be too condescending, but I said, well, what's it like to sell souvenirs? What, isn't it hard work? And he said, oh, this isn't work. This is love. This, I'm, this is, I'm putting my daughter through school. I'm keeping my wife in food. You know, that my work is not inseparable from love. And it really humbled me because I think sometimes we see work as, these, as this mission that's disconnected from the rest of our life. And we earn this abstraction called money. And then somehow that feeds into our life. Whereas this this Damara um, tribes person who was selling rocks on a beach, it felt like he understood work in a deeper way than me. That, ba that basically, he, maybe he sold a few rocks to tourists who were not always very polite, but then he was reinvesting in his own community. And so it's funny that you mentioned the Skeleton Coast. I actually love the Skeleton Coast. And it appears a couple of times because that stretch of Africa, which isn't a typical tourist attraction, it taught, it taught me a couple of cool lessons about the very subtle aspects of what travel can help you discover. Yeah, and, and I think the greatest discovery is really our hearts through travel. You can discover who you are through travel. And, you know, maybe we had more money than the guy who you talked to earlier on the Skeleton Coast, but he had more love. And who's richer, the guy who has more money or the guy who has more love? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it and that's what that that's what blew me away is that this guy was not seeing money as a transactional unit. He was seeing it as a love unit, you know. And um, what a great way to see a job that might otherwise. I, I think you know the United States is full of rich, unhappy people. Isn't that sad that there's people who have all this money but no perspective on it? And I think travel. And weirdly enough, it, it's often the poorest uh, people living the humblest lives who have time for you. You know, even when I was driving, I, I was driving an old rickety car years ago around the United States and it broke down in New Mexico and nobody really had time to help me except um, this indigenous woman who she knew her way around a car. She came up and like, well, all the all the, the wealthy people were rushing off to places. A woman who had a car that was really no nicer than the one I was driving at the time, she pulled over and it's like, let's let's help figure this out. Let's help solve your problem. And that was amazing too, that in this very busy part of New Mexico, the person who had time for me was someone who had less resources than I did. And you, you find that everywhere in the world. And um, it, it's humbling really to see that people with less resources are paying attention to a, to their lives in a way that oftentimes wealthy people in wealthy countries aren't. As I mentioned, I went to Namibia. I'm going to tell you a story based on what you just said. Um, and I don't actually know anything about cars. I don't know how to fix a tire. I don't know anything, literally. And I told people, I said to them, oh, I'm going to drive around Namibia by myself for three weeks. And they looked at me like I was insane because they're like, you don't even know how to fix a tire. How on earth are you going to drive around Namibia? What about all the bad things that can happen to you? Don't do it. I was like, no, no, it's okay. My intuition is telling me that I am going to be fine. And every time I had an issue with a car, I was helped. I knew that I would be helped. Now, I don't necessarily know that in certain other countries, right? But I just knew that I would be helped. I had faith. I knew it, right? And it, it, it's, it's because I've traveled. It's because I've seen the world. It's because I've had good experiences, bad experiences. And you can't, unless you've been on the road, you would look at my decision to drive across uh, Namibia for three weeks without knowing how to fix a tire as, as if I was insane. I remember 
I was just about to enter Etosha National Park and I had some problem with the, with the wheel and the guy came to help me and he said to me, where's the jack? And I said, I have absolutely no idea where the jack is. And he's like, oh, all right. So he looked for the jack and he found it and he fixed the, he fixed the wheel, right? Um, but you can only have that type of faith, I think, if you've been out there in, into the world, if you've had all these experiences, sometimes good, sometimes bad. I mean, I've had bad experiences. I remember I was in Thailand and it was a long time ago. I wasn't uh, 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 the type of traveler I am now. And this tuk-tuk came up to me and my friend. And, you know, there was something, my intuition was like, there's something not right with this guy. And I said to my friend, let's let's not get in the tuk-tuk. And he's like, no, 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 let's get in the tuk-tuk. I was like, no, 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 let's not do it. He's like, no, no, let's do it. In the end, I was like, okay. And the guy ended up taking us to an opium den, right? And I never forgot that. I was like, your intuition told you that this guy was not right. And you didn't listen. And I, and I had that in the first few years of my travels where I didn't listen. And it got me in trouble. And now I listen. If my intuition says, do not do it, I don't. What kind of like experiences have you had with your intuition? Well, sometimes my intuition has been wrong uh, in interesting ways. I mean, I was years ago when I was first backpacking uh, across Asia and Europe, uh, I got drugged and robbed uh, in Istanbul. Uh, I got roofied and they they took, and they took uh, my, the possessions that I had with me. I think... I had been traveling for so long by that point. I was like an eight month eight of a multi year journey. And I just sort of got complacent. You know, I, I just thought it was interesting. These guys were suspicious, but interesting. Well, they ended up drugging and robbing me. And so I think then there's other times where, where I've been suspicious about something and it's been this great experience. You know, I was, I was in Cuba once and um, we were going to a beach and there was some, it was just a lot of young people out on the beach, a bit maybe about an hour from Havana. People were walking around. There's people in Cuba don't have a lot of money, so they're just sort of making do with what they had. And um, I thought, oh man, I'm a little bit of an introvert. And so I thought, oh, this is awkward. I should probably find a bus back home. It's getting late. And then I ran into these guys who played the bagpipes, these Cuban bagpipers. And they went around playing the bagpipes and we met all these people. And I just had this great night. I was out until like five in the morning, but in overcoming my suspicion and my tiredness and sort of my lack of initiative that basically just waiting a few more minutes until something interesting happened. I was completely wrong about my intuition there. I actually had at the time of my life, um, you know, watching the sun come up the next day on this little Cuban beach. And so I think sometimes our, our, our instincts are, are, are good, but then sometimes our instincts for no good reason have been sharpened to be suspicious of things that actually could hold great experiences within them. So I've tried to be patient, you know, that it's one thing to be approached by, uh, you know, a dodgy tuk-tuk driver, but it's another thing to relax and talk to him for a while and get a sense for things. And I think oftentimes we don't give enough time to experience it to, to truly judge the situation. It feels like if you would have talked to the, to the tuk-tuk guy for 10 minutes, he probably would have gotten impatient if his job is to hustle tourists and take them to opium dens or whatever. He may have given up on you. So I think it usually is rewarding to um, to be, is it good to be a little bit cautious, but also open-hearted to these experiences that could take you into new directions? Yeah, yeah. I, I should have thought about that with the opium den guy, but I didn't. I was yeah. uh, I was too too scared at that point. Um, what are some of the like most transformational moments, like moments that literally shifted who you are as a person? And I'm talking well, about your travel moments. Yeah. Well, I think um, a lot of them are, are from my first travel experiences. And it occurs to me, it sounds like you were pretty young when the opium tuk-tuk driver uh, approached you. And I think sometimes negative experiences can teach us positive lessons. You know, it just, it sharpens your instincts as a traveler. So, um, I, I mean, I, getting drugged and robbed, I'm sure was a lesson in its own way. But the big lessons for me were like when I first started traveling uh, I got a van and kitted it out and traveled North America for eight months. This is before hashtag van life. It was just van life. It was before I had a, an online, realized there's an online community of people doing the same thing. And I think the life-changing lesson in that was the idea that travel can be an active part of your life. It doesn't have to be this consumer object that you buy in the same manner that you re buy running shoes, but in 
at age 23, I took eight months and I had this journey that I thought would be my last big journey before I became a proper American workaholic. What I learned is that it was it was cheaper and easier and and safer than I thought it would be. And in a certain way, I'm still on that trip, you know, that I I just sort of let those lessons and that inspiration flow into the rest of my life. And I've been alternating travel with sort of sharpening a sense for home ever since. And then, you know, all those early journeys, uh, living in Korea for a while, just realizing that for all of our similarities, there are cultural differences. And that's how we channel our humanity in a positive way. Culture can magnify certain aspects of people's humanity in different ways, including the souvenir vendor on the Skeleton Coast who made me realize that work at its best is a form of love. And then that first journey, uh, I was just dirtbagging it across Asia on a few dollars a day. Uh, it lasted about two years. And then I just I just realized those quiet lessons, those those human lessons that beyond any bucket list uh, destination on my journey, that playing volleyball and getting soundly beaten by a bunch of Cambodians who are a foot t- shorter than me, that was cool. You know, it was cool to, uh, to uh, just have this random game that there were no stakes involved, but it was a great way to spend an afternoon and to realize that it's those moments that life is made of. It's, it's not really worrying about the future or re- feeling regret about the past, but just embracing the each day, you know, and travel compels you to embrace each day because you're on the other side of the world and everything is new. But one lesson I've tried to bring home is that even in my tra- habit-driven life of home, it's really important to embrace each day in the sense that I would have on the other side of the world. So those those early travels just taught me some really important lessons. I'm sure it was the same for you. Very much so. And the, the point you made about how when you're traveling, you're basically you, you're in the moment. Uh, how, how do you stay in the moment when you come home? Because I've always had that challenge. Like when I'm on the road, I'm in the skeleton coast, I'm driving in the middle of nowhere, wherever I am, I'm in the moment. But the moment I return home, it's much more difficult. Have you managed to figure that one out? Well, if I did, I I could probably like invent some sort of product, uh, some silver bullet that keeps people in the the present moment. I think it's a staying present is a spiritual virtue and it's a spiritual virtue because it's not always easy. Um, And, you know, I was talking about how I, my wife and I, one of the inspirations for the new book is reading Thich Nhat Hanh's daily meditations. Um, And he has a great metaphor, which is about washing dishes. You know, when you're washing dishes, you should be grateful that washing dishes is what you're doing. And this is your life. And if you're thinking about some embarrassing thing you said yesterday, or if you're thinking about the great meal you'll have later, then you're not really enjoying the moment, the miracle that is washing those dishes. And I think he also said that if you're thinking about that that great bowl of cherries you're going to eat this evening while you're washing the dishes, then when you're eating the bowl of cherries, you'll be thinking of something else, right? <laughs> you're sort of living your life in the future. And so as Thich Nhat Hanh would, would reaffirm, it's not always easy to keep ourselves in the moment. I think one great thing at home is to go for a walk, even if it's just a five-minute walk at the beginning of the day. And my wife keeps me honest about this because she has sort of an aversion to screens and it's like, are you going to stare at your computer or your phone again? You've been, you've been up for 10 minutes. Really? You're going to open your computer, go outside. And so, yeah, I think I married well in that regard is that she's my partner. She's not my spiritual teacher, but there's a spiritual lesson in that, that the attention that you bring to a five minute walk, even if you live in the middle of a city, I'm blessed to live in the country is going to show you parts of life that are probably more important than the mediated life that you experience through your computer or your phone. So I try to remember that and I try to create good daily rituals at home, be it going for a walk or writing in my journal or reading to my wife at the first thing of the day. It's a reminder that even if it's not a perfect way, I know my monkey mind is going to be distracted by something at some point of the day. But if I try to start my day by being outside and creating good habits, then I'll be more likely to pay attention to the blessing that life is over the course of even a quotidian day at home. Do you know what your next book should be? Tell me. Basically about transferring the present moment of travel into the present moment of everyday life, where yeah. you write about present moment magnificence on travel and mm. you kind of weave it into how you can do the same thing in everyday life. I would buy that book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that's um, 
that, that's a good point. And I think that sometimes in, in, in a certain sense, the new book sort of has that as part of its mission. You know, it's a, you read one page a day, you can read it all at once, but you read one page a day. And so maybe you're not traveling today, but maybe those lessons you learned last year on your journey um, can apply to home, even while you're dreaming about the journey you'll have later this year. Um, but I'll have to think about that, like even a more distilled version of traveling at home. Because you know, most of us can't travel full time, I think even people who love travel don't want to be traveling for 17 years at a stretch, right? You have to these two at home and, and and abroad sort of become in conversation with each other. Uh, so I like the idea of, of having sort of meditations that say use travel as a metaphor. Remember how moved you were emotionally on the Skeleton Coast? We'll try and bring that attitude home. You know, um, that's a terrific idea. That's a, that's a worthy a worthy mindset to, to embrace. Indeed it is. So look, I, I have one more question for you, okay. uh, which is a question I always get. So I'm going to ask you, um, what are the, t- <laughs> what are the top three countries you've ever been to? I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to ask it. I have someone like you here. I need to know. Well, I knew, I knew that it was, I mean, that's, that's just what is what people fall back on because I think it's, it's a natural one. It's like the countries you connect to um, say something maybe about you or about your kind of attention. And so actually the first one is the U S it was the, it was the location of my first vagabonding trip when I was living in a van it, it changed my life. I'm looking out my window on a, a sort of an untouristic part of the United States, Kansas. I think it's a really beautiful place. It's also a very big place. So it's sort of a cheat answer. Um, and so that's what I often say, you know, that, and in a way that, that allows me to consider being at home an act of travel. If I, if I remember that one of my favorite places is the U.S., then it can remind me that, oh, hey, I'm already in one of my favorite countries. Why shouldn't today be an adventure as well? And then, then it gets really, it gets so tough because it's like, oh, can I, can I make that list a hundred, right? Um, I'm a big fan of Paris. I teach a writing class there every summer. Um, I'm not an expert on French culture. I, I teach my writing classes in English to uh, American or European students, and then, then I leave. But even ignorant of a lot of the local language and customs, I just love walking through that city. It's where the, the notion of the flaneur was invented in the 19th century, the idea that you're not walking from point A to point B, but you're just walking through the city in, in search of experience. And I love that so much. I, I'm a newly married guy, so I took my wife there for the first time. And seeing it through her eyes, she's a big foodie. I'm sort of a fool, few food for fuel guy. She's she's a woman who just loves the the beauty that is food and seeing it, this beautiful city that I thought I knew well through her eyes as, as someone who's like, no, let's let's spend an hour on this fromagerie because this place is more beautiful than you thought it was. Well, okay, all right, cheese. Let's see the universe through blocks of cheese. That was great too. And the third one to mention, I mean, there's so many that I could mention. Egypt is a place I love going back to. It sounds like you have a fondness for Thailand. Um, Patagonia is another place. Um, I might mention um, I might mention Mongolia, and it's been years since I've been there, but Mongolia is a place that it's like Kansas on steroids. It's, it's the it's Central Asian steppe. It's these grasslands that I grew up with. But suddenly when I went to Mongolia, it's like, oh my God, this this goes on to the to the ends of the earth. It feels like almost like maybe like you felt in the Skeleton Coast that you you feel your aloneness and you feel the sublime nature of the world in this wonderful wide open landscape. And of course, it's a part of the world where people, for all of the lip service we give to ourselves as being uh, nomads or digital nomads, there's so many Mongolians who still live with their herds. They follow their animals around and that's their livelihood. And they have a really humbling way of seeing the world. I remember once I was with my Mongolian guide there, he wasn't even a, a nomad. He was a retired policeman. He's like, oh, there's a step wolf. And it's like, where? It's like over there. Well, it was like two miles away. He had seen this landscape I was only looking in, you know, my way of seeing was was not attuned to the landscape of Mongolia that this guy was. And so I want to go back. I want to take my wife to Mongolia because she's a Kansas uh, woman, too, and uh, and rediscover that place because I just to use that word wonder. I was really, really reconnected with a sense of wonder in this landscape that was a little bit like my native home landscape, but was it felt like it was times 100 landscape. And so that's, that's, that's what I'll mention for number third, even though I probably have a hundred places I could rave about. Do you know what you should do? You should take your wife on the Mongol rally. Have you ever heard of the Mongol rally? I have, I have. Is that, uh, is that a motorcycle race or a no, you automobile drive from race? London okay. to Mongolia? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you want to go to Mongolia back with your wife, the Mongol Valley. One final question. How many countries have you been to? Oh, this is this is a tough question because it's like, well, what counts as a country, you know, and what counts as a visit, right? I talk about this in the new book because like Ro- Russia is, is like one seventh the size of the earth. So have you really been to Russia if you've been to on a, a drinking cruise to St. Petersburg, right? Um, and so I'm I'm I've, I'm in about 100 countries. I'm I'm at about 100 countries, but I've since the beginning I've I've tried not to be too much of a country counter because I've realized that like I could go back to Mongolia for the third time or Paris for the 15th time and I would even though it doesn't count as another country visited I would want that experience to be completely brand new. Yet on the same token it was I went to the Faroe Islands in Norway for the first time this this summer and it was really cool to sort of add to my to my list. So I'm sort of on the fence on on how I should count countries. Um, but let's just say a hundred. What about you? Uh, How many have you been to? 101. 101. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're, you're one ahead of me, but my estimation. I am indeed. I, I've always wanted to go to the Faroe Islands. I, mm. I sometimes I, cause I've been to most of Europe mm-hmm. and sometimes I'll look at a map of Europe and I'll be like, okay, haven't been to Moldova. Haven't been to the Faroe Islands. How can I justify just going there? So, because I am a country counter, sorry, but I am. The moment I land in the country, I'm so happy if it's new. I'm like, yes, 102. Like my 100th country was Dominica, not the Dominican Republic, Mm. Dominica in the Caribbean. And I was Mm. like, I was so pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when I grew up, um, it was fashionable uh, in the 80s when I was a teenager. uh, the cool travelers who lived in California, they would sew flags on their backpack. Every time they would go to a new country, they would sew flags. I was so jealous of these kids who had all these flags on their backpack. So I think even though I try not to be a country counter, I think the reason I'm not a country counter is that I too get excited by the idea of adding a new flag to my co- collection. And you mean the Faroe Islands is such a beautiful place. Actually, my sister has been to Moldova. She's a university professor. She had a former student that went to Moldova. It's like the least touristed country in Europe, right? And so when she went there in the company of her former student, she realized that the Moldovans she was with were really excited about soup. And she spent her whole week there, like going from Moldovian to Moldovian and trying these soups. And people were arguing about the soup and Moldovians really loved arguing and and cooking soups. And so my sister to this day can't eat a bowl of soup without thinking about Moldova. So um, when you go to Moldova, when you add that to your list, um, get some soup because Moldovians apparently are into soup and are passionate about a soup in a way that we Americans, or at least my sister until she met Moldovans was not. So... But you see, that's a beautiful thing. Like, we're not passionate about soup, but the Moldovans are. And let them be passionate about soup. God bless them. And they're good at it, apparently. I haven't been there myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rolf, it was was really a pleasure, truly. Um, And thank you so much for taking the time and, you know, just having this chat. We could chat for a, a while. I mean, clearly we have similar interests in the world. Um, and, uh, I hope your book sells millions of copies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, I do too. But if it doesn't, it doesn't. But it occurs to me, yeah, we can start the Skeleton Coast podcast. Like the, the two guys who are just excited about this uh, wind stre- windswept stretch of, of southwestern African coast. It's funny. You get two travelers together and pretty soon one one story sparks another story. Well, of course. another story. Yeah. Of course. I mean, I have a story about Moldova that uh, I'll tell it to you. Uh, I was in... Um, doing the Mongol rally in 2011 and I was driving through Romania on my way to Moldova. Um, and a, a couple of hundred miles from the border in a Romanian town called Moldovici, hmm. I had a car crash and it was pretty bad. We were fine in the end. And I couldn't, I never got to Moldova. And, and uh, I was saved by this 17 year old kid who could speak English uh, and had learnt his English from Rocky movies and Rambo movies, mm. right? And he took us to the hospital. And I'm still friends with this guy. Mm. Uh, it was 10 years ago, but that you know, those kind of experiences happen when you get out of your comfort zone. They happen when you drive from London to Mongolia. And 
I have another Moldova story as well. It's not as good as that one. But I was actually on my way to Moldova another time, a couple of years back. Um, and something something happened, and I, I had to cancel my flight, and I never got to Moldova. So Moldova is one of those countries <laughs> that I need to get to, but for whatever reason, I can't get there. Yeah, well, it'll happen eventually. Uh, order order a bowl of soup for me. Apparently, it's the best. I will. No, it, 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 it's funny. You talk about, like, I think we underestimate a couple things as travelers. One, our own resources, our ability to adapt. If our smoke f- smartphone breaks, we'll get a paper map and we'll figure it out. You know, if we can't figure out the bus system, we'll ask somebody and they'll help us. And that's the second part of it is that people are so much nicer and more generous and more open hearted than we give them the credit for. And so you're 17 year olds uh, on the Moldovan border in, in Romania or any number of people who didn't need to show me kindness, uh, but did. Uh, those are two things that uh, I think listeners can take faith in is that one, our resources are always deeper than we give ourselves credit for. And two, the the depth of kindness uh, worldwide, something that you know a lot about is much deeper than we give the rest of the world credit for. It's absolutely true. There is a lot of goodness out there. There are bad things that happen. I get it. But more often than not, it is a world filled with goodness. But we are shown the darkness. Fine. Don't put your hand in the sand, your head in the sand and and not think about the darkness. There is darkness out there, but there is more goodness. Go out and travel and see the world and you will see it with your heart. You will see the magnificence of the world with your own heart. And then you will come back and share it with your friends, your family, and God willing, they will go and travel as well. Amen. You said it well. (laughs) Thank you, man. It was a real pleasure. If you yeah. ever find your, yourself in Los Angeles, let me know. Yeah, I'll holler. Same if you come through Kansas. We'll do that for sure. Thank you. Take care, man. Bye. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you. I have a new video out in the world.